One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. This site is an archaeologist's dream. Being given the chance to excavate a possible ancient man-made island is rare enough, but if the circular earthwork really is a henge and we can prove that the two sites are archaeologically connected, then this would be one of the most remarkable prehistoric sites in Scotland. So is your gut instinct that this is prehistoric? Yes, 100%. Miles? Um, yes, I think a gut instinct it's prehistoric. The, but, the, but, caution. The caution, yeah, a word of caution at the moment. The, the actual basic shape of the monument fits uh, also a shape of other type monument types like windmills, uh, hut circles, various types of burial monument. But I think we can safely say at the moment that I think it, it is going to be prehistoric. If it's prehistoric, what could it be? I think we're looking at a thing like a henge, like Stonehenge, only a tiny pocket-sized example. Tiny little thing, but it's got an entranceway here, which is looking out over the lake, and if you like, the world of the ancestors, the next world. So it's a, it's a religious site. Have people always known that this was here? Well, it's, it's been an obvious feature, obviously, for thousands of years, uh, but certainly archaeologists have known it's here at least since 1970, when they cut out a, a quarter of this monument then. Uh, unfortunately their results were quite inconclusive so what we're doing is, is re-excavating the area uh, and hopefully trying to make sense of what it was they found. The first job is to remove all of the peat to define the area of the previous excavation. Geophys are in there as well conducting a survey to see if there are any below ground features at the centre of the circle. Henges tend to come in all shapes and sizes. This one, if it is one, is tiny, only 12 metres in diameter. They were usually places of worship or burial dating from the late Stone Age. Often divided and bordered by standing stones or wooden posts, henges were the focal point of prehistoric ritual. Only 200 metres away to the east is the intriguing little island in the loch. Roughly circular in shape, it doesn't look like a naturally occurring geological feature. It looks like a man-made island called a Cranog. Cranogs were places of habitation and refuge. Fortified raised enclosures constructed of layers of rocks shored up by stakes driven into the loch bed connected to the land by a causeway. Some were large enough to house whole communities. This one, if it is a Cranog, was probably only big enough for one roundhouse, one family and a few animals. Is it a Cranog? Um, it's a mound of stones that could be a Cranog. And we've looked at a lot of mound of stones like this. Sometimes you can say they're definitely glacial dumps and therefore definitely not a Cranog. With this one, we can't say it's definitely not. And the, the hints are that when you look at it underwater, the sloping sides are not a natural slope. So it looks as if it's been built from that point of view. It's quite circular. That suggests a Cranog. How are we going to dig it? Well, I'm told it is just made of a, a big pile of stone. So obviously, provided we're careful and we can record the structure of the mound as we go down, by the sounds of it, it's just a matter of moving stones. We will shift stones until we find something that says this is artificial. Uh, then we'll be very, very careful and we'll do everything in the most archaeologically exact manner, um, as we do on other sites like this. But at the moment, it's not an archaeological site as such. This area of the Highlands is jam-packed with ancient archaeology. Loch Migdale is surrounded by Neolithic and Bronze Age sites, mostly field systems and hut circles. But it was also the place where in 1900 the world-famous Migdale Horde was found a unique collection of bronze axes, jet jewellery and finely worked metal. Rob and Cara, who owned the land, appear to be living in an archaeological gold mine. Did you know anything about the history and the archaeology when you bought the estate? Uh, we knew that there were hut circles throughout the area, not just on our land, but I mean, there's an area called Aidens, which is further back up on the moor, which again is heavily um, circled, as it were. So we were aware of, of the artefacts that were in the area, although it had not been sort of studied. And then there's the Migdale Horde. And then there's the Migdale Horde. Did that actually come from your land? It did come from our land, yes. 
The Migdale Hoard is really interesting because that's the one bit of archaeology from this area that's actually been dated. The Cranog on the Henge, we don't know what date there. We've had no finds from them at all. The Migdale Hoard is the only finds. But do you know exactly where it came from? It was found in a quarry that's over there, a granite quarry that was being blasted about 1900. And when they were blasting, apparently, this hoard appeared. But it's hard to imagine exactly how it was found if they were actually blasting the quarry. You know, a rock came the off and there it was sitting. Yeah. <laughs> well, possibly. I think we need to try and find a bit more about that because that might hold the key to telling us what was so important about this area that it has a Cranach and a Henge, if that's what they turn out to be. The Migdale Hoard was a key factor in helping archaeologists understand the Scottish Bronze Age. But the exact place of discovery and blasting has been lost. We're going to try and find it. It's taken Nick, Phil and the Cranog team nearly all morning to stockpile the excavation gear, compressors and suction dredges on the island. But at last it's time to start diving. They've decided to put in two trenches, one in almost two metres of water, the second in only a few centimetres. Before he's allowed to dive, Phil's got to learn the strange techniques of Cranog digging. The biggest problems seem to be how to dig lying face down in the water. And how on earth do you know where your trench begins and ends? Is this there purely to, to aid the, the recording of the site, or is it just to mark the edge of the trench? It really is just to show us a general area to excavate initially. So whereas on land we'd use string and nails underwater, use a metal frame? Absolutely. OK, yep. let's move it. OK, what we want to do is go backwards. Right. You come out to about here. Right. By that time, I should be able to just drop my end. Why are we putting this trench over here in particular? Because this section of the site looks most artificial. Right. It's almost vertical stone face. The stones look almost like they've been made. And the bottom is not too silty. Nick's going to be working in the deep trench. His first job, start shifting the large rocks from inside his metal frame. It's back-breaking and slimy work. Back on dry land, John's got the results of his survey. What they're telling me is that we're not dealing with a settlement site. And you can tell that from? The lack of noise, basically. I've marked the approximate position of the ring. You can see there's just two spikes inside. And that one there is clearly that igneous stone. We're not getting any areas of burning. Um, the reason I don't see the bank and ditch is because it would fit with it being a henge-type monument. Right. Um, there's no sort of rubbish deposits. There's no burning, no, there's no burning, hearth or anything. No hearth. Um, people haven't lived here. That's right. what the results are telling me. Well, that's encouraging. So we can cross off uh, domestic settlement from our list of potentials. Yeah. Brilliant. So I think that's official then. From now on, we can all call it a henge. Everyone apart from Stuart, that is. If we've got a ritual site down at that henge and we've got a ritual site at that Cranog, you're looking for where the people lived? Well, I, I am, but I, just, I hate that word henge you've just used. Why? <laughs> well, a henge conjures up images of Stonehenge, a huge, great, great site. And what we've got here is quite clearly a small site. So if Stonehenge is a big cathedral, that's more like the parish church? That's it. I think we're looking at a small community on, on the lakeside here with their own special place where they might worship or, or bury people, yeah. So what should we call this thing? I'd call it an enclosure for the time being, I think, until, until we uh, really know what's going on. Have you found anything up here? Uh, no, not really yet, but what we have got is the sites and monuments records. You can see on here all these uh, references to prehistoric sites around here. And, and I'm trying to see if any of these features around here might actually help us tie your henge, my enclosure, to the Cranog and what might be going on around here in the prehistoric period. You can see there's all sorts of things on the surface around here. 
There's a, a, a very nicely shaped hillock just there, isn't there? Uh, yeah, it's just a nice, nice natural hill. Yes, it, yeah, yes? well spotted. Well, yeah. What about these two little piles of stones here? Yeah, they're piles of stones as well. <laughs> <laughs> these are our clearance cairns. They're, you see for the fields up here, they're nice and clean. They've been improved for pasture. Yeah. Well, one of the farming activities is to get rid of the stones and they dump them in piles. And that's what these are. They're, they're stones that have been taken off these fields. But what's interesting about these is it's very much the same sort of activity as the prehistoric farmers who built the enclosure or henge would have been performing to clear the ground prior to starting to cultivate it. I've always suspected there was more to landscape archaeology than met the eye. Back at the incident room, Carenza's hot on the trail of the Migdale Horde. Where did it actually come from? Do we know? Well, we know that it was found in May 1900 when they blasted the top of a granite knoll. And um, there's a rather romantic watercolour uh, which doesn't necessarily give you an accurate rendition of the landscape. And it says it was found in a weathered joint of granite knoll. <laughs> and it may well be that they, from the condition of the objects that they found it as they were putting the explosives down in a cleft in the rock. So what actually was in the hoard? Well, there, there were a lot of items. There was um, a flat axe head, and it's been tinned. The surface of it has been enriched with tin, and it would have given the axe head a silvery um, effect on the surface. There's also six armlets, um, which are graded in size, and if you were to wear them together, they look like a spiral armlet. There are two other things which have been called bangles. They may well have been anklets. And then you have these tubular sheet bronze beads, which had um, willow to strengthen them inside. And the fascinating thing about these is, is that they give us um, direct contact with Central Europe. Really? From that far away? Absolutely. Whereabouts in Central Europe? Uh, Bavaria in particular. So they were having extensive contacts with, well, Europe and the rest of England? Yes, that's right, and also with Ireland as well. We're at the northeast end of the Great Glen here, and we know that they were importing copper from southwest Ireland for making their objects here. I mean, one crucial question is what date is this hoard? We were able to get a radiocarbon date from the willow inside one of the beads, and that's given us a date of between 2200 and 2100 BC, which is exactly the time when you get the beginning of tin bronze metallurgy in Scotland. So effectively, what the hoard is telling us is that here at Migdale, we've got a very expensive offering of items from sort of all over the known world virtually at that time being made to the gods so it suggests there's something very important going on here. It may be that that henge site there is a very prestigious burial site, particularly given its location at the end of the loch. Actually in the loch, Phil, as a novice Cranog digger, begins his excavation by troweling in the shallow end. He's carefully loosening the silt on the bed of the loch, looking for anything that looks unnatural. The spoil's being drawn away by a suction dredge, which aids the diver's visibility by depositing the mud over 30 metres away. <laughs> it's weird down there, though, isn't it? As Nick works down, the rocks are getting smaller and smaller, a sequence of sorting that doesn't usually occur naturally. It's looking more and more man-made. But geological evidence isn't archaeological evidence. With most of the rocks removed, he's beginning to come down onto a new layer of sediment, a layer that appears to contain organic material. Possibly the first evidence of archaeology anywhere on the entire site. It's the end of day one, and we're now almost certain this is what we hoped it would be, a Bronze Age henge. There's still quite a lot of work to do on it. We're going to clear out the whole of this section of the ditch, but the exciting place is here the ditch terminus that marks the exit out of the Henge. And it seems to have been a particularly significant area for Bronze Age people. There could well be finds here. If we're going to work out who the people were who built this place and how long ago they built it, then the evidence lies here. Join us after the break. Beginning of day two at our Bronze Age site here at Loch Migdale in the Highlands of Scotland. And you may think that trying to establish whether this little pile of stones is man-made would be a doddle. But in fact, technically, it's been one of the most difficult things we've ever had to do. 
It took our dive team virtually all day yesterday just to set up and prepare, and they were really inhibited by the fact that we can't move through the middle of this little island because we'll stir up the debris and affect the visibility. So we have to pick our way round these stones all the time, which takes forever. But nevertheless, by four o'clock yesterday afternoon, they put two trenches in, one over there and one over there, and already it looks like they're coming up with the goods. What is it that's been making you so excited, Phil? Well, well, Tony, in the first trench, the one on the actual top of the mound over there behind you, we've actually got fragments of charcoal. What's so significant about that? Well, charcoal means burning, and burning is a, a, a sign, a very good sign, of where people were actually living. But the really good news is in that trench in there, in the water. Yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to see it because it's so deep and the visibility is so poor. All I've been able to see is this wonderful plan with these timbers. We've actually got timbers under the water. More importantly, we've got a stake which must have been driven in. And I'm dying to see it. So should we have a look at them? Oh, look at the so Look at that. Look now then. I reckon that that timber is that this is this one here. I reckon. Yeah. That that rounded bit. I reckon that rounded bit is that bit there. Yeah. Now look, that that there's the, there's a stake. You see that that round thing? It looks like a looks like a sort of tuppenny piece down there. Can you look tighten up on that stake a bit? Yeah. Look at that. Oh, oh wow. Look at that. Look at that, that, yeah, is not, that is not accidental. That yeah. is somebody who's actually driven that stake into the ground. And then just to the side of that. Oh, oh yeah, there yeah, it is. Yeah, Look, yeah. So, so we're looking, and according to this, it's 64 centimetres long and 12 centimetres wide, so it's quite a big timber. Fantastic. It's incredible, the degree of preservation. These little tiny, see these little cool, tiny, yeah. the, the little tiny bits of timber. That's this little group. That, yeah, look at it. Oh, they look like they're driven into, don't they? The other interesting thing is there's a lots of organic remains down there as well, so we should actually be able to tell what the, what the world was like or the, the, the landscape was like at the time these timbers were down there. What is that murky stuff that you were showing us down there? Uh, the organic material that I was disturbing is yeah. broken down vegetation, but the fibrous bits are bracken. And bracken's what they laid on the floor to make the place comfortable, a nice place to live in. Are you happy? that just from the evidence that you've seen, that what you've seen below the surface is man-made and is old? Uh, yesterday I was not too sure. I thought we had a big mound of stones. Now we absolutely have an archaeological site and a really nice one. With a forest of timber on the loch bed, we're going to be spoiled for choice as to which one or two pieces to sample for carbon dating. All of this murky organic stuff needs to be carefully bagged, sampled and cleared. But with it floating around everywhere, obscuring the visibility, it could be hours before we can see what else is down there. Today, the whole focus of the dig has shifted onto the Cranog, and even though it's freezing cold down there, everyone's getting really excited. But there's still a few brave people digging away here at the Henge. Yesterday, right at the end of the day, I said that they were going to excavate in here, which was the exit to the Henge, because we might get some finds here, and also that they would be clearing away this ditch, and you haven't done either of those things, typically. Why not? <laughs> um, but it's turned out to be a lot more complicated than we thought. When I started troweling out, what I found there was a stone packing, and there were dark patches and pale patches. I think we've got a post at the end here. Now, this is a cheat. You've just marked this with the end of your trowel, haven't you? <laughs> I have. I mean, if you, if you actually look at it, that material is distinctly really darker than the pale stuff over here. So this, this is probably peat that formed in the top of the void left by the post when it rotted. You've done quite a lot of cleaning over here, haven't you? Yes, yes. Well, what we've got here is the bank, which goes around the outside of the ditch. And you can see there's a, a, a lot of stones over there. Those stones, I think, are stopping the bank from flowing out. And the material at the core of the bank there is the stuff that's come out of a ditch. I've got basically the same thing as what Francis has got. You know he's got the post hole here? Yeah. Well, I've also got one here, yeah. which is, you know, respecting the sides of this entranceway. We've got the stones up against it, and inside at the base, we've got a lot of decayed quartz chips. 
Can I borrow you for a minute? Mm -hmm. just, just stand there. Mm -hmm. Francis, yeah. if this is supposed to be this ritual exit of mm -hmm. the henge, how come it's so narrow that, well, you're standing on the exit, but I'm in the ditch? Well, it's deliberately narrow. I mean, the whole point of an entrance into something like this is that it's special. You're leaving the ordinary world and you're going through a narrow entrance into a confined space. It's all part of cutting it off from the normal world. Just outside the henge, Miles is uncovering a jumble of broken stones, which seem to be lying in a small pit right in the front of the entranceway. You had absolutely no fines out of this site at all. No fines, no, uh, 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 apart from, uh, from, from quartz chips. Quartz chips were, were, were always banned. Carenza's tracked down Tony Woodham, the archaeologist who first dug the henge back in 1970, to find out more about his excavation. We only dug uh, at the centre of the, of the circle uh, from the inside of the ditch. Uh, to, to, to the, to the centre. It was about a foot, a foot deep. Right, so we've got a bit further to go to oh, hit yes. that area. Yes, and then indeed. you've got this black earth with charcoal. That's correct, yes. And that yes. was a sort of deposit cut into the sand, was it? It was lying on top of the sand. Right. It was lying on top of the sand. And we, we, uh, we removed that and, and it was just uh, clean sand underneath. It was in my mind that poss possibly uh, the site had been used during the Bronze Age for, uh, for, for a cremation cemetery. Now we've confirmed it's definitely a henge, we're still struggling to find out what it was used for. Stuart's now taken up the challenge to find the site of the Migdale Horde, and local resident Marion Fraser has brought him some crucial information. I was certainly taken there to see the site. You were? Uh, some years ago. Well, how many, many, years? many years ago. Many, all right, I won't ask how many, <laughs> you're a lady. <laughs> And uh, I certainly saw the granite. Can you tell me where it is? <laughs> well, it's on top of Karnafir, which is translated into English as mm. Talachil. Right. And in the vicinity of Kulnara. So you're saying it was found up on Tulloch Hill, and that's the hill just up there above us, isn't it? The path is just yep. beside the cattle grid, up to the ridge. We were told it was sort of way over there, which mm -hmm. it doesn't appear to be. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's, you know, to, to, to get this information is really valuable. Even though she was only a child when she was taken to the Horde site, Marion has given Stuart a detailed description on how to get there. Following the directions that Marion gave me, she said you go over the cattle grid, and this is the cattle grid here. And she said, you should walk up towards the mast, which there's the mast on top of the hill, just up on the right. He's staggering here, walking. So right in the middle of all this prehistoric activity on the surface, you don't have to dig to find this. And these mounds here, they're everywhere. It's around about every 50 yards where the prehistoric, the Bronze Age farmers, the people who built our henge, this is what they leave behind them. These are their fields, this is where they were living and where they were farming. We're all on a mission today to try and find out if the Horde, Henge and Cranog were in any way archaeologically connected. Henry, we're looking for evidence of human beings from thousands of years ago. Is GPSing the lake really going to tell us anything we don't know already? I, I think it will. Um, what, what I'm going to do is try and create a three-dimensional model of the base of the lake, so really just to look at the landscape context of the Cranog. But won't the landscape have changed since the days when people were living on that Cranog? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe we might see some sort of change in topography at the base, maybe something which might suggest a, a causeway between here and a the A path out from here to the Cranog? Yeah, yes. So the little variations that you can read might give us evidence of a pathway? I mean, we, we, we can hope. Yeah. Henry, I'm going to stop this interview right now because the water has just started to leak over the top of my Wellingtons. <laughs> Up on the hillside, and with only an artist's impression of the Horde site to go on, Stuart's now checking out every boulder. Now, this is exactly the sort of thing that is shown on the diagram where the artist at the time showed a rock with lines across it which sort of matches up with this type of weathering we've got on here. This is exactly the type of rock that at the time they were digging out to cut 
for creating lintels and uh, frames for doors, gateposts, that kind of thing. So again, all the ingredients that we're looking for are up on this hillside. Henry? Hi, Crenta. This is Sandy, who farms all the land around here. Hi, Sandy. Hello, Henry. And he reckons that as a child, he used to be able to, when the water in the loch was really low, actually walk out to the Cranog along a zigzag causeway. That's precisely what I'm trying to find us here. Where was it? Just about the evergreen tree there. Just, just literally anyway. just here? Yes. And how deep was it? When the water was low, to be about two feet below the water. Uh, oh, that's fantastic news. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. <laughs> According to Sandy, that should place the causeway about here. But to find the exact route, Henry's still going to have to survey the loch bed. With three orbiting satellites to give a global accuracy of a few centimetres, he'll be able to chart every tiny change in depth and produce a 3D model of the underwater terrain. Well, now I'm standing pretty close to where the artist drew this drawing from, I'm sure of that, where the Migdale Hall was found. It's Migdale Rock over there. I've got a knoll, high knoll to my left. I've got the curve of the lake to my right down there. This perspective is now matching very closely. It reinforces to me this connection between where people are living up here. We've got the evidence for it on the surface, quite clear evidence, and where they were being buried and, and where the kind of the religious side of their life, as it were, at the end of the lock, there's a connection, a visual connection between the two here. This is important information because we've finally confirmed the position of the hoard, almost a mile from where everyone previously thought it was discovered. Before I go, there's one thing I've got to do though. I must get a correct grid reference to this to ensure it goes in the record. And in a few seconds, it'll give me a grid reference which we can then put on the sites and monuments records so other people can come back to this place. Phil spent most of today lying face down in the freezing water and at last he's found something. How's it going on your side? It's going really well. I'm still working my way through the clay layer and I still have bits of charcoal and a bit of gravel to the side. You're still getting the charcoal then? Little bits, yes. Because I mean, I'm getting my first few bits on this side but I'm getting anywhere near as much as you. So it just shows it must be a, a very discreet little concentration. Not earth shattering, but more definite proof of habitation. Nick's doing slightly better with what looks like an animal tooth and bits of burnt bone. Let's hope the organic materials that are being bagged up will give us even more information about the lifestyle of our as yet mysterious Cranog dwellers. Back at the Henge, the excavation's progressing well, but with no more obvious structure emerging and no finds, there's a sense of frustration brewing. We have to find some datable artefacts, so we've opened a new trench 30 metres from the Henge that could be a prehistoric burial cairn. End of day two, and it's been a day of real mixed fortunes. Over there on the land side, we haven't come up with any new evidence in any of our trenches. But the Cranog has surpassed all expectations. We've found more wood than we could possibly have hoped for. So tomorrow, we're going to try and lift some of it in the hope that we can begin to solve the mystery of who built that island and when and what it was used for. Join us after the break. Beginning of day three in our quest to find out what was going on here at Loch Migdale hundreds or even thousands of years ago, and so far we've only been partially successful. We know we've got a man-made island, and we know we've got a henge. But because we haven't come up with any datable material, we don't know whether we're in the Neolithic, or the Bronze Age, or even the Medieval. So it's time for a council of war. How do we know what period we're in if we've got nothing to date it with? The thing about henges is they seem to be used as a, a kind of prehistoric observation platform and whatever people were doing in them in the Neolithic and Bronze Age, they weren't leaving any objects. Francis, that's a bit of a dodgy old argument, isn't it? We know it's old because we haven't got any evidence. <laughs> no, unusually for archaeology, it's based on common sense, actually. I mean, you wouldn't find a load of kitchen rubbish in a church or a chapel. 
So, I mean, this does indicate that this was a special place. And the other thing about it is that its shape is very, very characteristic of the sort of small henge-like things you get in the northeast of Scotland. So I'm perfectly happy with it being Neolithic or Bronze Age. In fact, it can't be anything else. The one place where we have got finds is on the man-made island. Uh, yeah. Are we going to be able to date them? Absolutely, no problem at all. Initially, we know we can get dates from them because we've got at least 50 pieces of timber. Because it's organic, we can get radiocarbon dates. Yeah, you say that we can get dates for them, but it's not yeah. dates we want, it's one solid date, isn't it? Nick, when we were chatting in the bar the other day, you were saying if it was a crano, you'd have bucketfuls of fines, masses of fines. Where have we, we have. gone? Well, I think all the timbers and the bracken that we found, the sheep's, uh, sorry, the animal's teeth that we found. Tooth. Um, uh, tooth and a bit. <laughs> tooth and a bit. <laughs> um, and the burnt bone and such. Like, I call these fines. You know, I know that you want pretty things, but well, underwater some things aren't very pretty. <laughs> so, uh, As a referee, can I play the sexism <laughs> card here? <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want to find something pretty? I'd call timbers part of the structure. Um, we don't know that until we excavate them because they may, some of them may be actual artifacts, maybe wooden objects. Just because, you know, that we can see the top of them doesn't mean that they are necessarily part of the structure. Okay, do you think we're going to get anything in the way of retrievable objects that are not part of the built structure? Yes. Yesterday, Henry, assisted by the local farmer, found evidence of a causeway on the edge of the loch. Today he's in deep water. I have to have this. And having trouble enlisting help. I don't do surveying, I'm digging. It's all right, if you, if you just think of it as like a very long, thin shovel, it'll be fine. What happens when the water gets up to here? Yeah, about there, Phil. Deeper here, Henry. So you want me to go that way? Yeah. Take, take one about there. All right, Phil, another go on another three metres or so. Just carry on, you'll be fine. I think it's deeper here, Henry. <laughs> no, keep going, Phil, you'll be fine. <laughs> Is that deep enough for you, Henry? Well, I don't know, let's just see what happens. You just take the next one, you'll be fine. It's all right for you, <laughs> isn't it? Well, <laughs> well, I'm not going in there, I'm not going in there. <laughs> back, back. <laughs> <laughs> Despite Phil's problems, the survey appears to show a definite raised area on the loch bed. With the entire trench cleared of silt and debris, it's finally time to start sampling some of the timbers. Unfortunately, this is a destructive process, but it's the only way to get a carbon date. The timbers appear to be in a fantastic state of preservation due to the oxygen-free conditions at two metres below. So you appear to have made quite a mess in my back garden by right now. <laughs> you asked us here to find out what this monument is. We, we, know, it's, we know it's a henge. And I think we're, we're finding out not only what, what it is, but why it's here. I think, I think there's some interesting ideas developing, aren't there, Alison? Yes. Go on. I'm, I'm really, really interested in the location and the orientation of this site because, as you can see, it's in a very striking landscape location. And if you look there along the loch, the way that the hills are going forms a perfect notch. And what they found is that the entranceway is really narrow. And what we need to do is to measure across and see where the exact centre of the site is and then see whether you get a significant alignment from the centre through the entrance. Do you mind um, holding a, a raging rod for us, Carol? Okay. Things are about to take a turn from the archaeological to the astronomical. And if we measure from the, the centre of the bank, Alison? Right, that's, that's 9 metres 50, 475, right? OK, I've got that here. We're trying to find a significant alignment between the centre of the henge, the entrance and the notch. But first, they've got to find the centre spot. I reckon this is about the middle here and... Just, yeah, that's, that's fine, Alison. Oh, goodness. 475, and that's exactly where I am. Come and have a look at this. Oh. What do you reckon to that? God. Francis, could you just stand in the centre of the entrance for us? How's that? Oh, wow, back. there you are. He's in the way of the notch. Is it? But another thing we need to consider is 
when people came here, what did they see? And to fully appreciate it, they've actually got to go up there and look at it from, from sort of a different direction. So this is essentially where people would view it from when they approached it. You can see there with the poles now, you see it pointing straight towards that, that notch on the skyline. It's amazing, yeah. It couldn't be much better than no. that. Yeah. Yeah. This has been very carefully chosen. It's a very special place. To find out which celestial body, sun, moon or star, would have aligned with and nestled in the notch over 4,000 years ago isn't easy. The Earth's constantly, if slowly, moving around its axis as it moves through space. This wobble, or precession, means that back in the Bronze Age, everything in the sky would have been in a slightly different place. Phil? Uh, 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 you should put the thingy down. Henry and Phil are still on the trail of their own alignment, but the lining up of their pole isn't so easy. Well, hang on. Yes! Yeah, OK, hold it, hold it there. There How's it that is. feel? You got it? It's a stone on the bottom there. Yeah. Right, move on. So do, do you reckon we might be getting it there? Let's see where this next one comes to. Oh, look at that! Look at that, right, hold it there. Got it quick! A steady, steady. Got it? Yeah, got it. Henry's hard-won survey shows the remains of a stone causeway that once may have been two metres wide and raised half a metre from the loch bed. Either this was a submerged walkway offering defences against invaders, or it was the foundations for a raised wooden walkway long since rotted away. Last evening, we opened a trench on what we thought could have been a prehistoric burial cairn. Alison, this is turning out to be the fourth monument on our site, isn't it? Yep. It's... What have we actually got here, do you think? It certainly looks like a small curbed cairn with the curb going around there and we're standing on it here. Right, yeah. And that hollow there looks to be robbing, where somebody's obviously gone to find the treasure or whatever. So you reckon there was a burial in there which someone's dug into and thrown the stones sort of over there? That away, yeah. But luckily for us, they missed this one. You think that's a second barrel? I think it could be. It's a very intriguing uh, cluster of small stones that have been deliberately placed here. I think we'd better keep these stones. They might well turn out to be specially selected, so yes. we'll put We're... them to one side. Yeah. This isn't going to turn out to be someone's cat, is it? Hope not, um... <laughs> from 10 years ago. <laughs> this possible burial cairn is only 30 metres from our henge, where new features are turning up everywhere. It's starting to look like a Swiss cheese over here. It is, but it's a lovely series of stake holes. What we've got is lines of stake holes that would have had wood in them radiating out from the central post. They would have stood probably about this high. So would these have been little fences or something? They could have been. There could have been an internal partition within the hinge. They're lines radiating out, pointing to distinctive features in the landscape. Or marking the stars? or marking the stars could well have been, we just don't know. How would you feel about having a ritual astronomical clock in your back garden? No, I think it's pretty cool to have <laughs> <laughs> This is all a bit different. It's looking a bit nicer now, isn't it? Right smack in the middle of the entranceway, we've got this sort of, um, sort of roughly square pit, and it's filled with stones. With this gorgeous stone on the side. This one's nice, isn't it? Is that been worked? It looks as though it's ridged. It looks like it's faced down this side, but there's certainly one or two sort of tall marks where it's been rather crudely sort of dressed along this edge. Could, could that have fallen? Or do you think that's the position it was in? Or is it um, I'd like to think it's fallen. Um, we don't know as yet until we actually had a chance to, to lift this, but it's quite possible that this fits onto this. And that's oh, actually a broken like kind of stump. Lintel? Well, it, it, it may well, and I say may at this stage, be somewhat upright, actually right in the entranceway, so we, we could have our, our first actual standing stone. When stood up, Miles' stone fits exactly in the centre of the entrance, and its alignment with the Misty Mountains can't be accidental. With the small stones removed from the top of the possible burial, Francis, instead of finding bones, is starting to uncover what looks like a wooden fence post. When we first hit it, I thought it was modern and it's got a square edge. But actually, now that we've got a bit more exposed, I'm rather excited. In fact, um, I'm extremely excited. I think... The reason why Francis is so excited is that the wood looks like it's been cleft or split with an axe. That's the way you work wood if you don't possess saws. 
And in the Bronze Age, they didn't possess sauce, so they had to split their wood. So if this is a Bronze Age steak, Alison, does this make you think it's something other than a cremation? It makes me think very hard, yes, because I cannot think of a single example of where you've got a steak above a cremation. So maybe this is a thing that really matters, and this was what was buried under this miniature cairn within a bigger cairn. The soil around the wooden post is littered with tiny white quartz chips, another sure sign we're in the Bronze Age. Though we don't know what they're for, these hand-chipped mineral pieces may have something to do with ritual purification of the monument. So you're well, confident these are man-made? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And they're very common on sites of this period. In typical time team fashion, it's almost the end of the day and we've got finds everywhere. Now we appear to have a steak to go with our chips. Is that one of the steaks? It's not really a steak. It's uh, in some ways more interesting. Why is it more interesting? <laughs> because it appeared to be set into another piece of wood which is embedded down underneath the organic material. It's about that deep. So what does that imply? <laughs> it implies that it's part of a more complex um, wooden thing. But, but do my eyes deceive me? Or are these tool marks on the end? There are tool marks on the end. That's absolutely. What... <laughs> well done. <laughs> Whether there will actually be little signatures on it from the damage in the blade of the axe, I don't know. But there are definitely tool marks on it. Now fully excavated, it's time to lift the very fragile wooden post. OK. Well done. That was no good there. Well done. Gosh. And there you are, with a, one of these quartz chips sticking to it. You can see it's pressed against that. Mm -hmm. That absolutely Wedge. mirrors that shape. So it's been squashed on there yes. for thousands of years, yes. and the wood has taken up that shape. So I'm in no doubt whatsoever that we have a piece of 4,000-year-old wood. I mean, as far as I know, nothing like this has been found in this kind of context in Scotland, ever. <laughs> oh, that's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, Isn't it? I, I've, I've never dug anything quite as odd <laughs> I mean, that was just weird. Oh, that's interesting. The only other items in this trench were two flat pieces of stone, most likely to keep the wood straight and upright. But the mysterious post still had one more secret to reveal. When it was cleaned up, it was found to be made not of wood, but of highly compacted peat. What Francis had excavated was the ghost of a tapered wooden post, which had rotted away, leaving a void which had been filled by the slow deposition of peat. I think it may be more to do with our marking of significant points in the landscape at yeah. significant times of the year than with any funerary thing. We haven't found any cremated bone at all in no. here. So, they, they, it, what they've done is to bury their sacred post. With all the timbers removed from the Cranog, the last job is to replace the large rocks lifted on day one. This is essential to maintain the stability of the archaeology and prevent further erosion. All of the Cranog finds are safely on dry land, and it's crunch time. First thing this morning, we said if there was one thing that we wanted, it was datable evidence, particularly out of the loch. We've got uh, some sheep's teeth, burnt bone of different sorts in there. I say sheep's teeth, but in fact, we've had a look at them. We think it might be deer's teeth. Yeah, possibly, so yeah. We've also got some sheep animal droppings in here, probably sheep droppings, and also there's charcoal. So we know that people were living out there. There's no doubt about that. We also said that there were some small stakes and timbers and we've uh, sampled some of those, here's one of them. That's the bottom of it there, and we have cut marks on the end of it. And I think one of the cut marks in particular, in fact, the nicest cut mark, which is this one here, is very small, I admit, but it has little striations on it made by damage in the blade of the axe that was used to cut it. But I think that that's a very interesting one. The and cut I... looks at first glance to be scoop-shaped. And for a moment, we all got rather excited because scoop-shaped cut marks are a Bronze Age phenomenon. And no one has ever found a Bronze Age Cranach. Oh, well, yes. 
but the scooping could also be sag, caused when a waterlogged find is exposed to the atmosphere. Which must be what happened, because radiocarbon dates put the timber firmly in the Iron Age, between 100 BC and 100 AD. And are you happy to say that our Henge and our Cairn are Bronze Age? Yep, I think they're Bronze Age, I think they're probably at the other end, the early end of the Bronze Age. In fact, Alison thinks they're from the very beginning of the Bronze Age, around 2000 BC. Which means we've uncovered evidence of 2000 years of human activity here on Loch Migdale. I think that that is something that's worth having a dram to. <laughs> <laughs> So what can we now piece together about the prehistoric story of Loch Migdale? Around 2100 BC, a community of people settled and farmed on the land above the loch. For a now long forgotten reason, they placed some of their most valuable metal possessions in a granite cleft, looking down on their ritual site, a henge. The focal point for what we would now probably call religion. We've calculated that the wooden post at the centre of the henge and the standing stone in the entrance aligned perfectly with the sun as it rose through the notch in the hills at the spring and autumn equinoxes. Almost 2,000 years later, the people of Loch Migdale moved down from their hill farms and built a cranog. Why they built it, how many people lived there and for how long, we'll have to wait for a future excavation. <laughs>